morning. morning. It is an honor to be here today. I'd like to thank the organizers of WCS Talks for putting on this tremendous event and for giving me the opportunity to share with you this idea that there is no why in waste. This idea actually originated a long time ago, back when I was still in high school, on the very first day of my internship at Beringer Ingelheim Pharmaceutical Company. I had just finished doing an experiment, and all the plastic that I used was piled up on my bench to recycle. I went up to the woman who ran the lab, and I asked her, where do I recycle all this plastic? I can't seem to find the bin. And she looked at me like I was crazy. And she said, we don't recycle here. All of that goes into the trash. And it was my turn to look at her like she was crazy, because why? It's perfectly good plastic. And she said, it goes in the trash. That's the protocol. This experience stayed with me as I continued to work in labs over the next 15 years. As a neuroscientist, I think I can distill my training down into three words. <laughs> Follow the protocol. As scientists, we're really good at following the protocol. Yet the consequences of following the protocol in laboratories is significant. Laboratories consume five to 10 times more energy and water than office spaces. And they contribute more than 12 billion pounds of plastic to the landfill every year. That's enough to cover an area 23 times the size of Manhattan, ankle deep in plastic. But the thing is, it doesn't need to be this way. I mean, I could see at the age of 18 that at least there was the opportunity to recycle plastic. So why is it that laboratories are consuming so many resources? Why is a good question. You know, as humans, we're really good about asking why about the world around us. But we are less good about turning that lens inward and asking why about ourselves, about our own behavior. Let me give you an example of what I mean by this. How many people here had breakfast this morning? Most of you, that's what I thought. My guess is your breakfast looked more like this than like this. Why? Well, the answer is pretty simple. We're in the United States, and in the US, we tend to eat breakfast that looks like what's on the left. If we were in another country, such as Japan, we might find ourselves eating rice instead. We eat what we were raised to eat, what we we're conditioned to eat. And over time, those conditionings become habits that we rarely question. What we don't realize is that by blindly following these habits, we unintentionally limit our choices and ourselves. There are so many things that we do in our lives because of how we were raised or what we were taught. As a scientist, I adopted countless habits, routines, and behaviors from my mentors and peers. Almost everything from how I kept my notebook to the chemicals that I used to how I operated the equipment quickly became habits that I never questioned, just like what I eat for breakfast. Asking why, interrogating our own behavior, allows us to uncover these assumptions and habits and routines of which we were previously unaware. And this is so powerful because once we are aware, then we can truly make a choice to do something different. Now that you're aware of your breakfast habit, you may choose to do something differently tomorrow. You may even eat rice, probably not. Choice is only possible when we are truly aware. Everything else is just automatic. So getting back to labs, I started to see that the answer to this question of why are labs consuming so many resources was actually rooted in the fact that we were all just following the protocol. And having seen this, I felt compelled to catalyze a change. I started a nonprofit organization called My Green Lab with the mission to create a culture of sustainability through science. And we approached this mission in a very unique way. We worked directly with scientists to help them interrogate their behavior, to ask why and then to uncover the assumptions behind that behavior. And once they do, they've done that, we encourage them to choose differently, to find the option that best sustains themselves and their work. In other words, we make sustainability personal. Let me give you an example of what I mean by this. We might go into a lab and see that all the equipment is left on all the time. This is very common in labs. And then we start a conversation, why? Well, in my case, when I left equipment on, it was because that's what everyone else did. And also, I kind of assumed that it couldn't be turned off. OK, but is that true? Not really. There are pieces of equipment that can be turned off. So why are we leaving them on? Why not turn them off? 
It is that simple. The conversations we have with scientists are simple, intuitive, and personal. And because of that, they almost always lead to a change in behavior. Now, turning off a piece of equipment may not seem like it would have that big of an impact. But the truth is that plug loads in laboratories consume 10 to 30 billion kilowatt hours a year across the US. And we've estimated that turning off pieces of equipment could save at least 10%. Put another way, if every lab in the US were to turn off just one piece of equipment, just one overnight for a year, it would be the equivalent of offsetting the carbon emissions associated with burning 60 million pounds of coal. It's a huge impact. And what's amazing is that this approach can be applied to every behavior in the lab, and that in aggregate, the impact is just as significant. Let's go back to that plastics that we started with. Labs have a habit of using single-use plastics and not recycling. Why? Well, we are taught to use single-use plastics for almost everything due to sterility. But is it true that we need to use single-use plastics in all cases? Of course not. Of course there are opportunities to use plastic, but also glassware. And there are many cases where you can reuse plasticware multiple times. And what about recycling? Is it true that labs can't recycle? Of course not. Of course labs can recycle the traditional things like cardboard and paper, and we've even had success in getting labs to recycle plastic. What's incredible is that if just 2% of the plastics used in laboratories were diverted from the landfill, either by reuse, reduction, or recycling, it would be the equivalent of offsetting the carbon emissions from 5 million Americans. It's huge. This approach to sustainability has been extremely effective. When we started the organization, there were 10 organizations that had programs dedicated to helping scientists reduce their environmental impact. Now, there are over 90 programs worldwide, reaching tens of thousands of scientists annually. This Green Labs movement spans all sectors, academia, biopharma, tech, hospitals, the food and beverage industry. We are affecting an industry that is three times larger than the building product space and just half the size of the automotive industry just by asking why. People are embracing this message because it is powerful in its simplicity and is extremely effective at driving long-lasting change. We have worked with hundreds of lab groups to help them use this approach to rethink their protocols and rethink their science. And of those groups, over 400 of them are now Green Lab certified according to our standard for laboratory sustainability. That's incredible. And because of this, they've generated so much momentum that companies that sell products into the labs have started to design their products and packaging with sustainability in mind. And laboratory facilities are being built to be energy and water efficient. And in a move that has me very excited, we're even starting to see laboratory buildings be built with space for recycling bins. It's amazing. Yeah, <laughs> finally, right? <laughs> the title of this talk is There Is No Why in Waste. When we ask why, when we interrogate our own behavior, what we often find is that behind that behavior isn't an intention, but just a habit, something we do automatically. And when we behave automatically, this leads to waste in the form of excess consumption. This isn't true just in the lab. This is true across all industries and quite frankly in our personal lives as well. Because let's be honest, scientists aren't the only ones who act according to how they've been taught. All of us adopt habits, routines, and behaviors from our mentors and peers. And we rarely stop to question them. The situation we find ourselves in is largely a consequence of this. But just as in labs, it doesn't need to be this way. Our behavior has a profound effect on ourselves, our community, and our planet. And we have an opportunity to transform the current situation by interrogating our behavior, becoming aware of what we do, and choosing to do something different. The time to seize that opportunity is now. All that's needed to get started is to ask why. Thank you.